And uh, my name is Tim, lead pastor here at Society Church, and we're starting a new series this Sunday that we'll be going through over this next month as we prepare for September. And I wanted to start off this morning with a poem. It's not a poem I wrote, but it's a poem that Langston Hughes wrote called Tired. And Langston Hughes was an American poet, a social activist, a novelist, a playwright, and columnist from Joplin, Missouri one of the earliest innovators of the literary art form called jazz poetry. Hughes is best known as a leader of the Harlem Renaissance. Here's his poem, Tired. I'm so tired of waiting, aren't you? For the world to become good and beautiful and kind. Let us take a knife and cut the world in two, and see what worms are eating at the rind. I want to focus on the first half of that poem. I'm tired, aren't you? Waiting for the world to become good and beautiful and kind. I think uh, when I read that poem, I was like, yeah, I I feel that. I'm tired of waiting for this world to become good and beautiful and kind. And I think a lot of us are. That longing and desire for the world as it should be. There's something within us that knows something has gone wrong, horribly wrong, in the human experiment that we call life. As we look at uh, this new series called The Great Commission, pretty straightforward, what we're really looking at is bringing about the good, beautiful, and kind world we all long for, for that to come to bear upon the world as it is today. This is essentially a summary of what The Great Commission means. We'll be talking about that if you're like, I've never even heard that before. You're not alone. Barna study showed that two-thirds of Christians don't actually know what the Great Commission is. So if you're like, I'm one of those, you're not alone. Uh, That this is a space where we're learning together uh, about the ways and teachings of Jesus. So we're going to be looking at what it means to be a living expression of our loving God for Sacramento and to the ends of the earth and what that looks like to be a missionary people. And you, you may have come this morning and you're like, you're going to teach me about being a missionary person? Like, I don't even know if I believe in some of the things of, about Jesus or the scriptures or I don't even have a theology and ideas about who God is. I'm not sure. You're just here and you're like, I needed to just feel comforted at church today. My hope is that you can connect with this teaching in a way that's personal, that maybe changes some of your thinking about what it means to follow in the way and teachings of Jesus, and that as we go through life and as we learn to live in the way that Jesus lived, that we can discover the life that Jesus offered. Because many times we get trapped in our own stuff that tiredness of longing for what could be, that good, beautiful, and kind world, and we don't know the way forward. And oftentimes when Jesus is described in the gospel accounts, he meets with people that are longing for that good, beautiful, and kind world, and he gives them something to do. And it's along the way, along their obedience, that they discover life and healing and renewal. So I want to encourage us to consider what that looks like and means. Now, here's what I know. For most of you in here, how many of you are from the age of 18 to 34? Just, it's okay. So the vast majority of people that came this morning and that come most Sundays to Society Church are in that age bracket. Here's what Barna, who's a research firm that does research with those who follow Christ and study culture and sociology, they wrote a paper called The Great Disconnect. And they said, Christians ages 18 to 34 express more concern than older generations about the history of missions, with one third agreeing that in the past, mission work has been unethical. So if most of you in here, when, when I even say mission, you're like thinking of colonialism or you're thinking of you know, the white religion kind of being spread through the ends of the earth. And I just want to take a moment 
and address that. I know for some of you that are outside of that age range, you're like, I don't think about that at all. <laughs> okay, that's just a reality. And uh, know that we're glad you're here if you're outside of that age range because you bring a different perspective and maturity that we need. Good Lord, help us. We need you. Right? I want to address this for just a moment. So many of those raised in or around the evangelical church are now identifying as post-evangelical or ex-evangelical. Has anyone heard that before? Okay. So most of them are are rejecting this co-mingling of the gospel with power-grabbing, conservative identity politics, a faith mixed with nationalism resulting in different forms of racism and prejudice, and the corruption of the megachurches and their leaders birthed from this movement. There's podcasts, there's Netflix shows, there's all kinds of media highlighting the dysfunction of what has already happened in the American church. And this series is not a plea to go back to church and culture the way it was, but rather an invitation to move forward into the hope of what the church could be and what we desperately long for, this good, beautiful, and kind world that we were made for. The gospel embodied and proclaimed. This is the hopeful fruit of a Christian spirituality that follows in the way of Jesus. So for some of us, the pushback to sharing the ideas and teachings in Christianity with those around us is that it is a, a white man's religion. Some people proclaim that. It's maybe been used to oppress and exhort the minority and vulnerable. But to think that that is all it is, is misinformation and a really ignorant assumption. The claim is uprooted from both Christianity's ancient origins and the current reality. So I'm going to just kind of present a case and get a global perspective and historical perspective of what the church and Christianity and its roots and and origins are in. Christianity holds its deepest roots with the Jewish people, who are one of the most enslaved and oppressed people groups of all of history. And Jesus himself was a Jew. His original followers and disciples and apostles were not white. They were all non-white. The church started in the Middle East, (laughs) was and is one of the most diverse, multi-ethnic religions in human history. Uh, Dr. Gina Zerlo, who is an adjunct faculty at gordon Conwell Theological Seminary, co-director of the Center for the Study of Global Christianity, said this, in 1900, most Christians, 82% of them, lived in the global north. This is Europe and North America. This is in the 1900s. Today, this proportion has reduced to 33%, meaning that as as of 2020, so this is even a couple years old, 67% of Christians live in the global north. South, which includes Africa, Asia, Latin America, the Caribbean, and Oceania, was once viewed primarily as a Western faith or demographically a predominantly white religion has now become a global faith once again, less centered on the United States and more diverse in its racial and cultural makeup than it has ever been. An article from the Gospel Coalition in April of 2021 pointed out, according to the research organization Operation World, Iran has the fastest growing evangelical movement in the world. The second fastest growing church is in Afghanistan, where Afghans are being reached in large part by Iranians, not white people. So if you're worried about coming across as a colonialist or a Christian nationalist when you share your faith, take heart that Christianity and Jesus are neither of these things. Share from your life, your perspective, your experience and the love of God found in Christ. Matthew 23, Jesus harshly rebukes the religious conservatives of his day known as the Pharisees which he had all kinds of um, harsh things to say. This is a, a list of woes from Matthew 23 that he was warning 
the religious conservatives, the Pharisees of the time. He said this, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when you have succeeded, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. Just gentle words of Jesus. <laughs> Can you sense his passion? Can you sense his, his determination, his, 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 his love for people beyond the religious establishment and saying, there is good news. Do not turn this good news into condemning news to assert religious power over people who need good news. This is a great warning about the potential hazards and pitfalls around what we're going to talk about, the Great Commission, to share a gospel that judges and condemns people instead of giving them life, a secure identity in Christ, dignity and hope in Christ. We don't want to share something that's going to condemn people but give them life. So if we, are tru- if, if we truly believe Jesus to be who he claimed to be, the only proper response to those around us is a passionate plea, a convincing witness, and an empathetic, patient, persistent demonstration and proclamation of the gospel. Uh, Many atheists welcome Christians who will proselytize or share their faith because they view it as a sincere and compassionate expression of what they believe. Uh, Penn Jillette, I think about 10 years ago, he did this YouTube video, and a prominent atheist and magician, and he was quoted as saying, how much do you have to hate people if you believe in eternal life in Christ and never share it with those around you? He shared this out of a person who came up to him after one of his shows and gave him a Bible and wrote a note in it, and he was just moved. He was like, this person, I I could sense they genuinely cared about me. I don't believe anything they believe, but there was something there that, yeah, did make me think twice for at least a moment. If you know Jesus Christ today, you know Jesus because someone was courageous enough to show and share the gospel with you. I want to spend some time seeking to persuade us. Notice I said us, not you. Because yes, there's some serious hesitations for myself as well. Persuade us into being more open and sharing about and demonstrating our faith in Christ with those we love. The scriptures, especially the early apostles of the church, were advocates of being a missionary people, inviting others to come back to God. One instance, uh, the Apostle Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11, and then 17 through 21, he wrote this, since then we know what it is to fear the Lord, we try to persuade others. More often than not, when I'm up here on a Sunday these days, I'm seeking to persuade you. That's why I use poems. That's why I use secular philosophers. That's why I try to talk about culture and where it is, seeking to persuade others. And what, are, what we are is plain to God here, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, gave us the ministry of reconciliation That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, his representatives, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Come back to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You can sense Paul's passion, his desire for the church. He's writing this to the gathered church in Corinth and different house churches that met together. And he was saying, you have been given a ministry of reconciliation, reminding those around you that God became sin for us so that we could have friendship 
restored friendship, reconciliation with God, and forgiveness of sins. Those sins are no longer counted against us that were viewed as righteous because of what Jesus has done on our behalf. And we are to be people that are pleading to others, come back to God. In our cultural moment, the idea that one religion or set of beliefs is more true or correct than another goes against the chief ethic of a secularizing pluralistic culture, and this chief ethic being that of tolerance. So I want to talk about that for just a moment. I think there is a way to believe and demonstrate and proclaim Christ as King of Kings, as Lord of Lords, as head over all of creation. These are words and sentences used to describe who Jesus is without coming across as a religious bigot. I think there are ways to believe, demonstrate, and proclaim that Jesus is the one who has defeated sin, death, hell, and the grave once and for all, and not cast judgment, but rather hope into others in the process. I think that there are ways to believe and demonstrate and proclaim Jesus as the way and the truth and the life while affirming the image and likeness of God and the dignity of humanity of all people without being obnoxious triumphalists. I believe there is a good, beautiful, and kind way to carry this good news to the people we love and care about in our lives. I mentioned the word triumphalists. Well, triumphalism is a smugness and boastful pride that one's nationality or religion is superior to all others. How many of you have ever encountered someone like that, right? (laughs) Thank you for not raising your hand. That's so gracious and kind of you, Uh, (laughs) right? But there's been people in my life where I've experienced that sense from them. It's like, oh, they have it all figured out, (laughs) Brian Zand, who wrote, Beauty Will Save the World, Rediscovering the Allure and Mystery of Christianity. He wrote this in 2012. So if you think of 10 years ago, what was happening in the world? Feels like a lifetime ago, does it not? Brian Zand wrote this. He said, In the pluralistic cultures of the modern Western world, the ugliness of triumphalism will prevent a multitude of people from seeing the true beauty of Christianity. A continual turning to the cruciform, uses that word cruciform to talk about the way and aesthetic of Jesus, that he would give over his life to death to show the love of God once and for all to the world, not um, asserting power and privilege. So the cruciform way of Jesus leaves no room for triumphalism. Yes, Jesus triumphed over evil, But he did so by the counterintuitive way of humbling himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. As we seek to assimilate the cruciform into our lives, it should always produce the beauty of a graceful humility and never the ugliness of arrogant triumphalism. If we are to show forth the beauty of Christ in our world, he writes, we must banish triumphalist attitudes from among us. It was the attitude of triumphalism in the Middle Ages that led to the ugly actions of the Crusades. Since Jesus had triumphed through the cross, it was reasoned, why not help spread his triumph through the conquest of the sword? The Crusades were the ugly offspring of a union of power-obsessed pragmatists and arrogant religious triumphalists. He wrote in 2012, and I fear that this kind of distorted thinking may have certain modern equivalents, you think. The cross is the beauty of Christianity, Zand writes, because it is at the cross that we encounter co-suffering love and costly forgiveness in its most beautiful form. I'm going to say that again. The cross is the beauty of Christianity because it is at the cross that we encounter co-suffering love and costly forgiveness in its most beautiful form. But the question is, can we see the beauty of the cruciform? In a culture that idolizes success, can we see the beauty in the cross 
In a culture that equates beauty with a pretty face, can we see past the horror of a grisly execution and discern the sacred beauty beneath the surface? Christ upon the cross, Sand writes, arms outstretched in the gesture of embrace, refusing to call upon avenging angels, but instead loving his enemies and praying for their, for, for their forgiveness. This is the form and beauty of Christianity. The cruciform is the posture of love and forgiveness where re- retaliation is abandoned and outcomes are entrusted to the hands of God. The cross, he writes, is laden with mystery at first glance. It looks anything like, it doesn't look anything like success. It looks like failure. It looks like defeat. It looks like death. It is death, but is also the power and wisdom of God. This is mysterious. It is also beautiful. This is the mysterious beauty that saves the world. The cruciform is the aesthetic of our gospel. It is the form that gives Christianity its unique beauty, Zand writes. And he says, it is what distinguishes Christianity from the dominance, uh, from the dominance script, dominant script of a superpower. To reintroduce the gospel into our cultural moment is a distinct risk. In a post-Christianized culture or post-Christendom culture where the values and some of the beliefs and teachings of Jesus have been adopted by the majority that are now slowly not becoming that way, which is due to secularization, leaving God out of that equation, seeking to create a more pluralistic society, which is not necessarily a bad thing. I'm just going to be honest because we want to give people choice and room to be able to explore faith, consider what that means and looks like for them, not just for culture to place that on them. Because cultural Christianity has not served us well. I'm just going to be honest in a lot of ways. The danger becomes in that type of cultural context we find ourselves in of this post-Christianized, post-Christian culture is this. I already know that. I already heard it. Went to church my whole life. You can stop there. I go to church once every five weeks. I know what you're going to say, right? I know God. I pray every once in a while, you know? And, and I'm going to be honest with you. That was my experience. I'm going to share a little bit of a story here, but first I want to share um, what that is. There's actually a scientific name for that. The illusion of explanatory depth. The illusion of explanatory depth is a scientific term for thinking you know something more deeply and fully than we actually do. This phenomenon uh, occurs when individuals believe they understand something better than they actually do, preventing them from going further to uncover and fill hidden gaps of knowledge. The Yale University psychologists who developed the term explain most people feel they understand the world with far greater detail, coherence, and depth than we really do. So how does this show up in faith? Well, in a post-Christian culture, people are like, yeah, I I get that. I got that. I grew up with that. I I remember... uh, after high school, I moved up to Truckee, and I started snowboarding. I was like, I'm going to snowboard and figure out my life that way. And I had a friend that I'd snowboard with every once in a while, and he was a born-again Christian, and he was excited about his faith. And every chairlift ride he had, he saw as a, a window to present and preach the gospel to every person he rode that chairlift with. And uh, I would ride with him, and most of the time, I'd just listen to him talk to other people, because I'm like, I already know this guy, like, we're, we're fine, we're good, we're friends, and, but one time, one afternoon, he's like, we, it was just the two of us, right, in the chairlift, and he was like, Tim, do you know Jesus? I'm like, yeah, man, I go to church, I used to go to church when I lived at home, I grew up going to church, he's like, but do you know Jesus? I'm like, yeah, man, I pray every once in a while, like, I got this, we're good, mostly for him to just leave me alone, right? Like, you're wrecking my vibe right now, man. Like, stop talking to me about Jesus. I'm trying to just, like, enjoy the mountains and the snowboarding and 
do that thing. But it was that moment that I realized I don't really know Jesus. Yeah, I'd, I'd experienced him in, in a Sunday school class when I was young and experienced kind of this strange warmth of the spirit and the love of God finally connecting with my mind and heart and emotions and getting baptized. And yes, there was a moment of faith and experience with Christ, but that was it. I was holding on for dear life to that one experience and never connecting beyond it. I had the illusion of explanatory depth that was a shallow, immature, lacking faith. And I remember uh, moving home from Truckee after I got hurt snowboarding, and I had friends that I knew didn't know Jesus that I started to snow or skateboard with again, and they they like were not just didn't know Jesus like. Their parents didn't know Jesus. They didn't go up growing to church. They dealt drugs. They did drugs. They dropped out of school. They skipped school. It was not a great trajectory for their life. And they had come to know Jesus. And I'm like, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Like, they kept talking to me about how they're experiencing the love of God. And they would invite me to church. And I was like, this is weird. (laughs) But their lives had changed. Like how they showed up with the people around them was transforming. And I was like, I've missed something along the way. I've missed something. And they began to help me fill in the gaps. They modeled a Christianity that was spirit-infused, that was inspired by love, that was hospitable and kind and relational and resilient. And I'd never seen peers model that before. And there's something about that that caught my eye, that caught my heart, that began to renew my faith, that began to deepen my faith. And sometimes what happens in those kind of experiences, many of you may have had experiences like that in your life. Some of you maybe have yet to have experiences like that. But we tend to hold on to those moments and say, let's just replay that record over and over and over again. And then every experience from that point forward seems like it's just missing the mark. It's not what it was, not realizing that God's wanting us to go deeper and not only to be recipients of that kind of grace and kindness and love and hospitality and community, but to be creators of it. And this is ultimately what the Great Commission is about. It's God sending us out, not as consumers of Christian community and teachings and helpful ideas, but contributors and creators of it. So how do we persuade, inform, demonstrate, and make the gospel what it is in our day? Good news of great joy meant for all people that the good news of Jesus Christ is still good news. I think it's a life and hope for a world filled with goodness, beauty, and kindness. I want to look at uh, Matthew 28, which is really the beginning point where Jesus makes it really abundantly clear to his closest followers of what his purpose was. And this is what's known as one of the two great statements of Jesus. So we've got the greatest commandment. When Jesus is asked, hey, what's the greatest commandment? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And he says the second is like it. It's intimately linked to the first, to love your neighbor as yourself. Great statement of Jesus, worth memorizing, worth putting to heart, worth worth living into. The second great statement of Jesus is the lesser known one, the Great Commission, because the Great Commission demands all of us. The the first great statement does too. The second great statement kind of pushes us outside of our comfort zones for us to consider others. And here's what Jesus said and how his disciples were showing up. This is Matthew 28, verses 16 through 17. It says, then the 11 disciples went to Galilee. Remember, one of the 12 betrayed him and then, unfortunately, took his own life. The 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him. But some doubted. That may be a hopeful statement for some of you this morning. 
like the 11, the ones who walked, like saw Jesus flesh and blood, saw miracles, saw him like breaking bread and then multiplying and feeding massive amounts of people. Like Jesus, the one who said to the paralyzed person, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And he did. And you're like, oh, one of those 11 like came, showed up at the mountain, worshiped, but there was like all kinds of doubt and questions. Those are the people. Those are our people. That's us. That's humanity. That's our experience of life and faith. It includes doubt. I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. Verse 18 says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, of all people groups, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. I want to look at just the first part of this and then get into some practical ideas of how in the world can we do this, okay? First part, that they, they listened to what Jesus said. They, they followed him to the mountain. They showed up. <laughs> For some of you, like this Sunday morning, like you showed up. Someone invited you, a friend, a family member. Um, you found us online. I don't know what it was, but you showed up, and you're just like, okay, God, I'm here. And maybe you even worshiped. You maybe even sang the songs, you know? And you maybe, like, in your heart, you're like, yes, Jesus, I need you. I'm here for you. This is about you. And you held doubt as well. Like, I've got lots of questions. I've got lots of concerns. I've got lots of criticisms. I've got lots of critical thoughts rolling around in my mind right now. To know that you're not alone. The ancient church, the original disciples and apostles held that same space. And Jesus met them in that space and called them to move forward amidst it. Here's, uh, I think, a helpful way to think about it. Uh, Monkey bars. I remember growing up, elementary school, Carl Sundahl in Folsom Elementary School, Going to, <laughs> going to the playground during recess and watching the people, uh, my peers, do the monkey bars. And I was like, that looks amazing. Like, look at them go, right? And, and, and they would like, some of them would like skip like a monkey bar, you know, and just like, wow, look at them go. Look at them swing. I'm like, I could do that. I could do that. Yeah, there were tricks. You know, they, they, they seemed to make, they made it look effortless. I remember getting up, Carl Sundahl Playground, looking at the monkey bars and like, okay, it's my turn. Climbed up the little three steps, grabbed onto that first monkey bar and just held on for dear life for 10 seconds <laughs> and then fell. I was like, this is harder than it looks. This is what doubt and faith, the relationship between doubt and faith is like. It's like monkey bars. You build strength. I eventually built enough strength to be able to hold my body weight. I, I began, I kept watching them do it. I'm like, oh, they're like, like getting momentum. They're like swinging. They're like pulling back with one, and then they're like, whoa. And I was like, okay, this makes sense a little bit more. And I remember, you know, getting that down and going like halfway and then falling because I'm just like, I'm tired. Like my hands hurt. Oh, my gosh. This is intense. And then, you know, the effortless monkey bar swingers going on. And I'm like, I can do this. I can get this. Faith and doubt. You can hold both at the same time. Sometimes it's like people who are struggling and processing through doubt and questions and, and concerns and critical thinking. They're like, I can't, I can't have any faith because I have doubt. Like, that's not true. That's not true. It just is a matter of learning how to build enough momentum to reach out for what's next. Hold on to it. Get your balance. Build some more momentum. And yes, there's some doubt that's behind you, but it's behind you, and it's meant to propel you and build momentum for what's next. And that is the hope, that we're moving and growing and developing a richer and stronger faith as we go. 
And doubt is meant to build momentum, to build a muscle, to, to research, to dive into those questions and concerns, to consider them with our minds and our hearts and our lives, to look at them in community, let others speak into those spaces and places, and allow God to be a part of processing the doubt. Jesus is a master at meeting people amidst their doubt. Remember Doubting Thomas? Jesus did not run away from Thomas when he met with him. He's like, stick your hand in my side. Feel the nail marks in my hands, Thomas. Stop doubting and believe. Jesus met him in that space. There are answers. There is hope. There is clarity. There is wisdom to move forward in our faith. So just to encourage you, you can hang on for 10 seconds and fall to the ground, and that's progress. That's where it starts. That's not where it ends, hopefully. But that's where it can start. We can learn to go halfway through those monkey bars and be like, my hands hurt and fall to the ground. And that's all right. There's grace to get up, to shake it off, to find rest for your weary hands. Jesus is with us in that too. And then to go again. I hope is that's a helpful analogy. Just to think through. It breaks down at different points, right? But to think through... What is doubt and faith? How does that relationship look? How is that building a stronger faith as I learn to navigate that with God? All right. Here's some practical things to consider. Uh, one is that our God is a missionary God. He's a missionary God. I think we have a, a slide here where it talks about this kind of grand narrative of Scripture of what we see God doing in Christ the Old Testament is just a setup for Jesus, the Messiah, to come to fulfill the law and the prophets that we could never do. And then to uh, say, hey, the Father has sent me. In John 20, 21 through 22, Jesus says, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. The Father has sent the Son. Uh, then the Son, Jesus sends the Spirit. John 15, 26, Jesus said, When the advocate, the Spirit, comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth goes out from the Father. He will testify about me. The Spirit is meant to lead us back to Jesus, sent from the Father, sent from the Son. And then the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, sends the church. This is Acts 1, 8. Jesus says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This is the story of the rest of the New Testament, of the disciples being sent, the Apostle Paul meeting and encountering Jesus, and then equipping and encouraging and teaching the church of how to understand who Jesus is and how to live that out, how to proclaim that in a way that can be understood. That This is the, the whole of scripture, our missionary God. So what is the mission of God? You might be like, so what does that mean? I, everywhere I go, I just need to be teaching people about Jesus. How does this practically look? Because people aren't going to like that. I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to lose my friends. I'm going to lose my family. I'm going to be all alone. There's, there's going to be no one to go and make disciples of, right? That's how it works. Um, <laughs> So what is the mission of God? What does that mean? What does that look like? All sorts of things fall under this rubric of mission. This comes from a vision of the new heavens and the new earth that we see described in Revelation 21 and 22, as well as Isaiah, from the gardening in Genesis to the city planning in Revelation. Uh, John Mark Comer, in his book Garden City, describes this as moving from the garden in Genesis 1 and 2 to the heavenly city of Revelation 21 and 22. This is the meta-narrative of the entirety of Scripture. God is wanting to bring healing and renewal to all of creation through a missionary people. The point of the church is not to build a big church. It is to develop, disciple, and empower a group of missionary people sent to be salt and light, full of goodness, beauty, and kindness into a dark and decaying world. If our God is a missionary God, then we are to be a missionary people. And the good news is, some of you are just like, oh my gosh, this feels so overwhelming. The good news is you're already doing some of this. 
you're already doing it. Without even knowing you're doing it, you're already doing it. So here's quick, real practical, four ways to become a missionary people. Four ways. One is incarnation. Incarnation. We see in John 1.14, John describing what Jesus did. He said, the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. That where you live is already where you've been sent. You don't have to go overseas. You don't have to go to a different people group. You've already been sent. God's already put people around you for, with purpose and intention. So how might our neighboring, how might our family and friends and, and coworkers hold divine purpose in the mission of God? This involves developing a deeper understanding of place and the value of relationships at work and beyond as part of God's mission. You may think of your workplace and like, I, the work that I get paid to do is ridiculous. I've met people who've said that to me, like, I get paid good money to do something that seems like it's not bringing renewal on anything anywhere ever. And, and I, I usually answer that with like, that's sad. <laughs> Maybe it's time to look for a new job. But also, like, who are the people you work with? Because for you to have a sense of purpose amidst a purposeless set of tasks in your workplace could be a witness to the gospel. Like my purpose is much deeper than what I do with my life. It's who I'm becoming and how I'm loving those around me, regardless of what I'm doing. That's this idea of incarnation, being a people of presence. That wherever we are, being fully there. I know at some point... At, Probably this point in my message, most of you are thinking about, where am I going to eat this afternoon? We're almost done, uh, and uh, let's be fully present. Incarnation. Demonstration is the second one. How to become a missionary people. Demonstration. Serving and loving those on the margins of society. Walking in spiritual authority amidst a dark and decaying world. Live, learning to live a spirit-led life where our words, our actions, our relationships, work and faith are integrated into a more and more faithful expression of love and power in our everyday lives. Where healing, renewal, and new life is both preserved through our presence and springing up all around us. Demonstration. How might that look for you? Embodying the fruit of God's spirit, love, peace, patience, kindness. And then proclamation, a third one. This involves both disciple-making and sharing our faith with our words that we're able to give a reason for the hope that we have in Christ. In 1 Peter 3.15, Peter encourages us to be able to have a reason for the hope that we have and to share that with those around us, being able to teach and explain what Jesus taught to others. See, Jesus' call to go and make disciples wasn't just to share like the four spiritual laws. We're going to talk about that next week. What is the gospel? It's much more, much more broad than just Jesus died so you could go to heaven. Much more broad than that, Okay. That's part of it, but a very small part. It's an important part, but a very small part. Being able to teach and explain all that Jesus taught to others. The gospel is meant to be good, beautiful, and kind news for all of life and into eternal life. Uh, and then the fourth one is my favorite and probably one of the most uh, forgotten ones, recreation. Recreation. How do you rest how do you enjoy life? How do you find joy in this world? Can I just tell you, no one wants to listen to someone who's anxious, stressed, overworked, and overwhelmed by life. I'm like, whatever good news you're living out of, pass. <laughs> right? Be a human being, please. Not a human doing. Develop a rhythm of life with God that brings delight and fullness to your life. That's one of the reasons one of our main teachings here that we'll revisit with new people who come into Society Church and continue to do sermon series about is developing a rhythm of life. 
learn how to be with God, how to stop working and rest and delight in God in life so that we could be a witness to the fullness of life that Jesus said he came to give us, not just eternal life, life after death, but life before death. That is our witness to a dying and decaying world, life before death, develop a rhythm of life. Possibly one of the most profound witnesses of our anxiety-ridden cultural climate is that. As we close today, I, I want to give you some even super practical applications of this, okay? Because the question quickly becomes, how do we do this? Like, how does this look? How can the church help me in this journey of being a witness to something much greater than myself, the love of God in Christ? Um, you know, we are starting Alpha, which is creating space for people who are curious, um, people who may be described as atheists or agnostic, maybe have no faith in God, or maybe even you know, are like antagonistic towards the faith, for them to have space that's hosted by people who love and care about them to be able to have discussion, to be able to consider the claims of Christianity, the truth claims about who Jesus is, and to move it from places of division and just like anger and rage into a place of just, hey, let's talk about it. Let's, I want to hear where you're coming from. Share with me the words. Share, share with me your experience. Be heard in community. Find a sense of belonging. Because as we do that, as we're able to engage in that space, both as Christians and as those who would not consider themselves Christians at all, there's a, a, a processing that's happening and that, that I believe the Holy Spirit is amidst in revealing truth, helping people to find and experience healing. So it's a hospitable space where we share a meal together. Uh, we are able to um, break some bread. There's nothing like sharing a meal with someone that breaks down kind of walls immediately because you're like, you're human, I'm human, we all need to eat, let's enjoy a meal, right? To have uh, some intentional uh, content that's, that's curated, that people are able to, like a 20-minute video where people are able to just kind of wrestle with, okay, what are these things about Christianity, about Jesus, and how can I, you know, wrestle with some of these thoughts and beliefs, and then to have a group where discussion happens. So that's a really practical thing. We're starting at September 21st, and our goal is to have about 50 people that are not Christians. So this is not for those who identify as Christians. If you're a Christian and you want to come to Alpha, there's a way to serve and help create that space for others and participate along the way, but it's not for those who would identify as Christians. This is for us to host for people who are exploring faith. There's a video that I think is helpful in just kind of understanding where a lot of people are at and where some of you may even be at this morning. I want to play that and then give you some practical pieces of how to engage with it. Okay. Why do bad things happen to good people? What's the purpose behind all this? What did he have in mind when he created me? What's next? Why are we here? Why do we have to die? Just why? What is the point of all the suffering? Yeah. Why evil exists? All the conflict, like why? I guess the ultimate question would be why? Why? I feel uh, most alone uh, when I'm surrounded by a lot of people. No one sees my side. Sometimes you just feel like you're in it alone, having to make the decisions all by yourself. When people are not listening. It feels like no one gets me. I don't know the answer. I don't believe in God. Life's so hard sometimes. I think people just need to feel wanted, loved, and accepted. I think all of us want to be known for who we really are. They need a place where they feel like uh, they belong. I hope that that
that resonates with you or with people that you know that you're in community with, uh, maybe family members, friends, coworkers. And we're going to be talking more about this as the month goes forward. Uh, we're looking to raise money as well as help with this effort and initiative to create that hospitable space for people to explore faith apart from a Sunday worship gathering. If you want more information about how you could potentially partner with us in that, you can go to societychurch.com forward slash alpha. Okay, so super practical, kind of how do we get kind of feet on the ground, our hands involved with this idea of the Great Commission and how to do that.